Um, if you want to bring up the presentation that we're going to look here, it'll be on the inside right end. It's kind of towards the top, listed as the day one slides is where we're going to start. Um, so if you're looking, just making sure you're in the right room, um, this is AWD 11111. Um, if you're looking at inside ranking, you'll see a different name. It'll say .NET Framework with Web Databases. That's the old name for this course. Uh, we changed it about a year ago because we shifted what technologies that we teach in this third semester course. So the old name's there. That one's incorrect. What this course is actually called now is database web development. Uh, that's what we're focused. And basically what happened is we switched out um, .NET, which is what we used to teach, into Node, and, and that's kind of where our focus has been. And part of that's just industry technology shifts and keeping up to date with that. So uh, that's maybe what you see, but you may see a different name elsewhere. That's why, because um, we shifted that name around. Um, if you're looking on Insight Rankin, um, you'll see the course information and the instructor information towards the top. Uh, I've got a link here to Perusal, okay? Um, this is what we're going to use for all of your textbook type reading. Um, so there's a bunch of videos and a bunch of reading material that I'll be putting up there. Some of it's already there. There'll be more as the weeks go by. Um, you may have noticed if you look through the bookstore, it said, hey, there's not a book. Well, because this is what we're using instead. Um, it's a free service. Um, so there's no kind of purchase cost for that survey, uh, for that for this service. Um, a lot of these pieces are things I've found online or taken and modified and kind of rewritten and compiled and put put up there. So some of the stuff is is things that are out there freely available in a way that we can kind of talk about them and discuss them online, which is going to be really great. Um, plus some things that I've kind of put together. Okay, so that's what you'll kind of have out there. Uh, there will be a bunch of stuff out on perusal that we need to take a look at, and we're going to look and get started on some of that today. Um, you know, I kind of looking around, I see I've got my, my class of a few of you I've seen like uh, just a week ago because we were doing a summer class. And the rest of you I don't really know yet. So we'll kind of have to help me learn names and all those kind of things as we go go forward. It usually takes me about a week or two to, to learn everybody's names. So forgive me if I don't know your name immediately, um, but I usually have that down pat by, by week two. Okay, so one thing I need to do um, for today is I do need to take um, attendance. So let's see, just looking what's here. Uh, Michael Algiers, you're there. Cool. Um, Evan Arneas, okay, there. Uh, Chase Barden, there. Okay. Uh, Parker William, yep. Brandon Carrillo, right there, okay, uh, Don and Michael Clark, Michael Clark, not here, okay, um, Cody Gardner, uh, David Jen, uh, Aaron Larkin, okay, cool, um, Danny Lai, okay, and am I saying your am I saying that name right? No. Okay. Uh, Adrian Smith. Adrian Smith. No, Adrian Smith. Um, and Joshua Williams. Okay. Cool. That's good. Okay. So going back to the the main page on the course, if you want to follow along where we're going to start, um, I'll have you click on the top here under overview. You're going to click on AWD 111 uh, day one presentation if you haven't clicked on that already. Um, and we're going to pull this up. This is where we're going to kind of start and go over things. So I'm going to switch over to presentation mode and you can see what's here. Okay. So as we've kind of talked about this AWD 1000, Rankin, Fall 2021. Um, I'm Mr. Smith. I'll be your kind of teacher for this semester as well as next semester as well because I teach the mobile application development um, part of this as well, doing the Android apps. And so we do that next semester. Um, and that tends to tie in a little bit with some of the things that we'll talk about here in terms of like REST APIs are kind of a big deal that we learn in this semester and they really apply in terms of building mobile apps. So that's kind of the crossover point, uh, usually. 
as well as databases are an important thing when building mobile apps. So that also is a thing that you're going to see crossover. Um, kind of giving you some background of, of who I am. Uh, I've got a bachelor's in computer science, bachelor of science I got from UMKC, got that about in 2010. So I've been out of college for about 10 years, um, suffice it to say. Um, there's a lot of changes that ended up happening around 2010. So there's, I've seen things shift in the industry a lot, um, kind of between then and now. Um, during uh, 2011 through 2017, I worked as a software developer. Uh, software developer at two local companies here. Uh, the first company I worked at was doing radiation therapy planning at a company called Electa um, and Swedish based company but that's what we were doing primarily in C++ and MFC and doing that kind of thing. The, the, actual, the actual program that I was working on I think was originally created in the 70s. Um, so there were a lot of dated things but we did a lot of update between you know we had C down at the bottom end, but a lot of the code I actually ended up writing when it ended up being C sharp. I also had to talk to C++, so that was kind of an interesting architecture to work in. After that, I went to work at a company uh, called Biomedical Systems um, in the area over in Maryland Heights, um, and they do we did electronic patient reported outcomes, and what that meant is we had these Android devices that we would basically give out to patients. Um, they would take that home and complete surveys on that on their own time as part of a drug trial. And so part of my work there was kind of working on that mobile app and, and gathering the data. I did a lot of server stuff, especially a lot of database stuff in terms of transferring that data around between the mobile apps and the, and the web component of that and the reporting and all those kind of things. So that's kind of where my background Yes. Um, I started teaching here in the fall of 2017, so I've been teaching here for about four years now. Um, coming into my, my fifth year of doing this, that's kind of where my professional background sits. So I've got a lot of got six years of experience out in the field before I even started teaching here. And there's a lot of hobby projects that I still do on my own time to kind of try and keep myself up to speed. Um, in terms of languages, I know um, there's a lot of stuff that I can speak to. There's a lot of stuff that's well beyond even what we teach here because I do this stuff for fun too. And I've been coding honestly since about 16. Um, so I've, I've actually been coding for about 20 years, um, all told. <laughs> so there's a lot of things I've picked up along the way. Some of these tools I've, I've used for a long time, some of them I will never use again, and I'm okay with that. Um, because industry shifts, right? So industry shifts all the time. There's there's technologies that come in and they come go, and so there is definitely a place for keeping up to speed with those those technologies. If that makes sense. So some of the ones I'll, I'll have it on the next slide. The main one we're focusing this semester is, as I'm known, I'll also be using MongoDB in there as primarily our database. Um, so that's kind of where we're going, but I'll talk about a little bit more with the specific technologies that are our focus for this semester. Um, you've taken first semester already, so hopefully you learned some HTML, some CSS, and some JavaScript. Um, in this course, I'm really going to assume that you have a good foundation of that. We're going to be building on top of that, um, but more than likely, uh, wherever your JavaScript sit at, skills sit at, you're probably going to have to move those forward. Um, there's a lot of things that's happened in the JavaScript world. In fact, I think the world, the book that you guys went through was like the third edition book of the Muroc one. Um, my summer guys, we went through the fourth edition. There's been a lot of changes between those two things. So in the, what it comes down to in the last five years, I'd say, five years or so, there's been some radical changes to JavaScript as a language. Um, unfortunately, the book that you went through wasn't up to date with all those those things. So when we get into the JavaScript portion of this, we're going to really have to talk about some of what those new things are, what are the new language features in ES5 and ES6 and some of the newer things that have come along after that as well, just because there's a lot of kind of shifts in the technology and the languages. Um, you'll find even in the documentation for some of the technologies that we, we are going to use, um, some of those are even even that haven't kept up with the last five years, so it's kind of things you have to just know. There's new ways to do things, and there's old ways to do things, and and just being aware of that. Okay, so the JavaScript that we write this semester will probably look a little bit different 
than the JavaScript you wrote in the first semester. Just so we're clear. Okay, so we'll talk about some of those some of those things. We'll need to talk about you know what are those new language constructs? What are the, some of the things you missed from the textbook? I think my my guys from the summer are kind of already up to speed with most of those, but we got to get everybody up to speed on those kind of things. So we'll talk about that around week three. Um, what some of those new JavaScript things are that we need to know. But my background's pretty varied in terms of a lot of different languages. And I think you'll find this with a lot of industry professionals. Once you start getting in and you have really taken interest, you start picking up technologies here, technologies there, about what you like doing and what the job requires. Um, more of my background. Um, I was born in, in Indiana. We lived in, when we moved to Switzerland, and we lived there for eight years. Um, so I still speak a little bit of German from that that period of time there. Um, that's kind of my background. We moved to Kansas City around 98, um, graduated and moved out here from Kansas City uh, to St. Louis for my first job, and, and that's kind of where I've been for the past, I guess, 10 years now. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of my background. Um, just got married about two years ago, which has been great. Um, and that's kind of ongoing. We that was in January, so we're we're coming on three years around, by around the end of the semester. Um, as far as things I'd like to do, um, interests and specifically in the uh, computer science world, you know, my interests align a lot with things like concurrency and parallel processing. You know, using multi-core um, processors and graphics cards, including that's the that's something I've done a little bit with to really do a lot of work at the same time. Um, so that's one of the things that I have an interest in, specifically data structures, algorithms. Sometimes you'll see me talk about things like that of that nature. Um, data modeling specifically is one that we'll see a lot of this semester, especially the first two weeks. We'll be talking about kind of how do you build the database and, and what are those kind of some of those considerations that you need to make. Um, I do a little bit of get development on the side. There's, um, I'd say, in terms of projects, I say at this point I've done somewhere between 10 and different, 10 and 20 different games, um, game projects that I've kind of done, and mostly over a, a kind of a weekend sort of things, little small projects. Um, CI/CD, um, let's talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery. It's one thing I've also kind of got an interest in. Um, this is really important in the modern world. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what we'll we'll talk about here in this course, but it deals with kind of taking the code that you have and immediately trying to get it tested and, and live on the website without you having to do too much interaction with that thing or also picking up issues before users see them. So that's kind of interesting there. Marvel Comics, other interesting there. Um, as far as I, what, what I do for hobbies, I work on websites, I do web development. That's part of what I do um, as a hobby. Sometimes I make games. I also do that as a hobby. Um, I've been known to play games. I've had less opportunity to do that since I've been married, other obligations. Um, but, you know, given that, we now do, me and my wife do a lot of antiquing. That's kind of where we've been able to spend most of our free time, uh, pandemic stuff and such. Um, I've been known to collect action figures. I've got an entire kind of shelf um, in my office at home of Spider-Man action figures and such right now. Um, things I do, again, Marvel comics and movies, it's kind of been things I watch. So that's kind of my background. Um, you can look at more portfolio if you're, if you're curious at all to see some of those things that I've made. Um, Load that up. It'll come up in a minute. Um, including, if you're curious, so there's the link to my GitHub, link to my YouTube channel, um, some of the stuff that I teach, projects I've worked on, different things like that. And if you're all curious about, you know, what games have I made in the past, and you want to see some of that, all that information is there. You can kind of go take a look at. That's it. Game development is your is kind of your one of the things you'd like to do in the future. You know, take a look. You know, it's something that I do as a hobby. I have actually been called that by one of my coworkers in the past. <laughs> 
Um, so, yeah. Michael, correct? Okay, go on. Go. Omar got that down. Okay. Go back to the what? So I see if I'm um, I'll check real quick because I can check that for that for that here. Um, but you weren't on that list this morning, so you sh more than likely are fine. Yeah, no, you're you're good. You're good. Um, just a reminder: class here does start at 12:35, though. Okay. So now that I kind of introduced myself, um, what I'd like you to do is kind of go around and, and introduce yourself and kind of give you some, you know, what's the background of what you're doing. So part of, and part of why I asked to do this is just so, hey, I can kind of understand where you guys are coming from. It, it helps inform my teaching. It helps inform what kind of examples I give and those kind of things as topics. Um, sometimes it informs of projects um, as well that I give out. Probably not as much this semester because I'm doing that a little bit different. Um, but it also just gives an opportunity for you to connect with your other classmates and kind of see where you have shared interests and, and maybe people that you might like working with or, or collaborating with. So that's that's kind of why we're doing this. So I'm going to start from that side and we kind of move our way around. All right. So there's my questions. What is your name, etc. Go ahead. So. Um, that's kind of the you know intro, so you kind of have some idea with names and faces together and where people are at and kind of the you guys as a group where you kind of fit. Um, one of the things I'll say, you know, from Rankin's mission, our goal is in two years in this two-year program to kind of get you to a point where you're ready to go out there and get a job. Like that's our goal. Our goal is to get you those skills and the the proficiencies and all those kind of things, the knowledge you need to just go directly go out there and, and work in the industry. And so this course is really a big part of that, um, a big part of that mission, because one of the biggest things, like the biggest areas of jobs and web development and stuff that is available out there, most of them are web development jobs in terms of programming, and most of them involve a database, right? So you know, this is kind of like the key part of the program that, that makes it all work. And so some things that you've learned up until this point are helping to set you up to where we're kind of going. You know, from first semester, you learned HTML and CSS and Bootstrap. And so that factors in, in terms of building out the front end and making it look good. Um, but it also doesn't, but at the same time, you didn't really focus a lot in the first semester on all the magic, the, all the things that are going on behind the scenes. Um, to make something work, you know, whether it be Amazon and, or some other e-commerce platform, whether it be uh, Twitter or Facebook and, and all the social media platforms, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes working with databases. Um, you learned a little bit about that in second semester when you looked at C Sharp. You learned kind of some programming fundamentals, some object-oriented programming. I think you guys even touched on a SQL database a little bit, right? Microsoft SQL, right? So. You maybe have a little bit of introduction to databases and and whatnot. So so that's and that's actually kind of where we're going to start um, this week. We're going to get back in, in in talking about databases and specifically SQL databases. Um, I'm probably going to go a little bit deeper on some theory aspects that maybe maybe you didn't have a chance to do kind of at the end of your C sharp semester. Um, so we're going to be revisiting a lot of the topics and kind of really focusing on the theory of that. How do you build databases in the first place? How do you design them? Um, so that's kind of where that fits in. And so again, so one of the things that we see from that is, you know, we're trying to prepare you for employment. We'd ask that, you know, you make that part of your goal. Part of your, part of your thing that you're shooting for is to get a job in the next year. Right, to get a job when you graduate. Um, in fact, I've had a lot of my students that get jobs during their um, during their time here. I've had several of my students get programming jobs doing this web development stuff that we're teaching here while they're in this very semester. Um, so do keep an eye out there. Do start making those relationships because you may find um, I've had plenty, I've had several of my students, you know, get a job around like by November or December of this third semester, right? Um, because they're in a good place and had a good grasp of this material. Does that make sense? So, so definitely one of the things I encourage you to do is really keep an eye out, you know, take a look at 
Uh, we've got our job board for ranking. You know, get signed up for that. Keep an eye on what's out there. Look at other job boards. Keep keep in mind of what's there. You know, go to the job fairs and, and kind of be involved in that. Okay. Um, one of the things that you're going to see in this semester is going to be a little bit different. Um, we, as a college, as a program in general, we focus on projects, right? Yeah, I think Evans told you that a few times. So we're, we're, we're focused on building projects and building out that portfolio, building out things that you can demonstrate that you've done. Okay, so the project that we're taking on this semester, I'm just going to say is pretty large, right? So I'm gonna, we're going to see the first part of it about week two or three of this course. And that's going to take us to the end of the semester to finish it. So we're looking at, you know, what we're trying to do this semester is there's a three-month long project on that. Okay, not a lot of downtime, just so we're clear. Um, but there's, that's that's one of the things that we're going to see. Um, previous previous classes, you've probably done a lot of little projects. Here's a little project here. Here's a little project there. And um, what we're focusing on here is really a very big project. We may do some little projects as we're kind of introducing some of the concepts. But there's an overarching project that we're going to be working towards. Does that make sense? So recognize that that's going to take some time to invest and, and go for and work on um, to make all that happen. Um, it, it's actually big enough that we are going to cover a certain chunk of it. And there's actually more you could do if you were going to go beyond what we're just going to do in class, because it's actually a pretty big thing. Cool. So just kind of have that be in your mind. But part of why I'm taking, part of why we're going to take on that project is it's just a good thing to kind of fit into, uh, fit into and be able to show um, at the end of the semester for kind of what you learned and what you've done. Um, so in terms of things that we're going to learn and languages and technologies that we're going to focus on, here's kind of the overarching view of what this semester is all about, okay, in terms of the technologies that we're going to be focusing on. So JavaScript is the big one, right? JavaScript is going to be what we're doing all except for their, like the first two weeks of class. From there on out, everything is going to be JavaScript, basically. Right, so JavaScript we're going to focus on a lot. Um, and again, we'll have to go deeper on some of the new things in JavaScript, but that's the, that's the technology we're focusing on. Cool. Um, we're going to be using a technology called Node. Node is basically a way to write JavaScript that runs outside of the browser. Um, what you did in first semester was you strictly wrote JavaScript that ran in the browser, connected to the JOM, worked a little bit with jQuery, um, but what we're actually going to do here primarily is write JavaScript that runs on the back end, that does all the actual heavy lifting that's not really on the front end. Okay, So that's, that's where JavaScript is going to come in. It's going to be on the back end running through Node. Um, Node is, is kind of a platform that lets you build any um, application, any application you want. Um, in JavaScript. So we're talking about, you know, basically you can write, uh, at this point you're able to write with Node, you can write command line apps, you can write web servers, which is what we're going to be doing. You can use it to end up building mobile apps um, through some processes that are available. And you can build desktop apps using Node as well. In fact, um, the IDE that we'll be using this semester called VS Code, incredibly got introduced to already already in their first semester, VS Code is actually built on top of Node using something called Electron. So it's actually the very IDE that we are going to be using is also built on these technologies as well. Um, we'll be using something called NPM, Node Package Manager. Um, that's a way to get source code and, and, and libraries and things that have been written by other developers and then they put out there freely for you to use. So there's a lot of packages that we use in terms of building websites that are out there and freely available and we'll go through some of those as we work our way through. Um, most of my node projects end up having say 10 to 20 um, dependencies from NPM. Things that other developers have written. I don't write all the code myself anymore. I can take some of the code that other people have written and integrate it into my project. Um, and one of those things that's available on NPM is something called Express. And Express is kind of going to be our foundational framework that we're going to build our web servers on. Right? So web server gives us that foundation, that framework um, on top of Node that then lets us build some really cool web applications on top of it. Okay? So that's part of what we're going to have in there. 
towards the end of the semester, um, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about the front end and getting back into HTML and CSS and those kind of front end technologies. And one of our goals there is we want to get into something called React. Okay? So React is one way to build your web front ends. Um, that's opposed to, say, jQuery, which you learned in first semester, or vanilla JavaScript, which is where you just directly access the thought. So that's our goal. Uh, we want to focus on React. To be honest, I've never taught React. Um, I know a little bit about it. I've got about um, two years, a year or two now to, to learn it and kind of get familiar with it a little bit. But it's still a very new technology to me. It's not a technology I've taught yet. Um, so that will be kind of something that we'll have to just play as we go. Um, but that will be kind of towards the end of semester. In there, we also want to get back to Bootstrap, and we'll also use that in combination of React, mainly for just looking and making things look good. Right. So those are kind of the, if you want to know what technologies to focus on, that's, that's the technologies that we're focused on this semester. Cool? Um, there's a lot of other little things that we'll talk about there, like we're putting our code in Git, we're going to host our websites on Heroku, there's all these kind of things involved as well, um, but that's our main goal. Um, in terms of the ID that we're going to be using, it's VS Code. You can get that at, at code.visualstudio.com. Um, this is not to be confused with Visual Studio. Um, when you took the C-sharp course, you would have gone through Visual Studio to write your C-sharp code and your desktop applications. This is a little bit different. Um, VS Code is a much more lightweight um, sort of IDE. Um, some people have actually referred to it as a text editor. It is that lightweight. Um, but it's actually really, really powerful. Um, it's developed and maintained by Microsoft. So Microsoft does own this. Um, but they've been really, really good about making this open source and, and using open source technologies to the point where this is free and you can use it on any operating system. So VS Code does run on Mac. It does run on Linux. It does run on Windows. You can really run it on anything you want, um, which is really nice. The combination of it being lightweight and cross-platform has been a really amazing thing. Um, plus the ability to easily, there's a ton of extensions out there to make it better and improve it. In fact, we'll be installing about seven to ten of them to do some of the things that we want to do. Okay, so um, this has been a really, really popular um, IDE at this point. And pretty much, you know, when I look at the grand scheme of, of people developing Node, pretty much everybody who's working on Node is using this IDE. So it's a really well you know, in terms of industry adoption, it's been really, really good. So getting into kind of how this course is going to run. One of the things that I want to do and one of the things I've started shifting to, um, and we saw a little bit of this in the summer as I'm kind of trying to figure this out, um, is this kind of clip flipped classroom model. Okay. Uh, traditionally, what we do um, in terms of how courses run is is mo the traditional course is like, well, the time you spend in class is mostly the instructor lecturing and such, and then you have to go home and do hands-on work. We've, as Rankin, we've had a different kind of tact on that, so that's been a little bit, not been as much of our case, but I'm trying to push more towards us doing more hands-on, even though we have done. Uh, so that means I'm going to focus less this semester on trying to do actual, like, traditional lectures. I'm going to be delivering more of that material online that I might otherwise de deliver to you by just talking your ears off, right? So you're going to see that a lot of that material gets delivered through um, perusal. A lot of the stuff I'm going to, rather than lecturing and, and talking your ears off about it, I'm going to put the documents up on perusal. You can read them. And then we'll talk about what the questions are. So rather than me repeating everything that was in the repeating in the reading material, I'm going to focus on just let's talk about the pain points and see how we can apply this. What are the things that weren't in there that we need to talk about or talk about more? Does that make sense? So unfortunately, one of the things that that means, though, in order to kind of make this work, um, this means to, to flip it that you need, I really do need you to do the reading and the watching the videos and that kind of homework crap outside of class so that we can product, be productive in class and just talk about discussions and do hands on stuff. Does that make sense? So one of the things that means is all the reading assignments 
are actually going to be due before we actually talk about it. So I may, I'm before I actually lecture or discuss it, before we discuss it in class, I'm going to ask you to do the reading beforehand. Um, so if you look at all the due dates on perusal, they all say that they're due at noon, right? Because I'm trying to get you to do it before we discuss it. Does that make sense? Um, so the expectation is go read that the day before, and then we'll talk about it in class. And then I, with perusal, and we'll talk about this, um, there's the ability to add comments directly on the text and questions and things like that. So that means that if you do the reading beforehand, I then have the opportunity to take the things that you've commented and asked questions about and actually talk about them and, and kind of answer that question for everybody. Does that make sense? So that's going to be a little bit of a different, different model. I am going to still give some lectures, like traditional lectures, because there's still some things that I, I think we need to dive in a little bit deep on. Um, but outside of that, I'm going to be a little bit more informal about how I give my presentations. Cool? So that's just kind of an alert um, as far as that goes. Um, there's a lot of theory in this first week. Um, so my plan actually is that I've got a lecture queued up for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday um, because there's a lot of theory to unpack. Um, that means as far as your first lab assignment is concerned, um, your first lab assignment, I think we start around Thursday or Friday of this week. We've got a little bit of, of things to get ready and going before you can kind of get your hands dirty. Cool? So there's a lot of theory up front because we need to kind of set the stage and, and, and understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and how that all fits in. Cool? Any questions on that? Does that sort of make sense what that kind of flipped classroom means? It means we're trying to do more hands-on and more of the theory outside of class. Okay, so some general tips for success. Um, really ask for help. That's one big thing that I think especially people who, you know, you've got people on both spectrums, it's like, well, some people, sometimes people are reluctant to ask for help because they think they don't need it or that necessarily that not asking for help will end up making you a better student or a better developer. Reality is you should ask for help. Regardless of where you sit on your skill level, you should be asking questions constantly. Because what you're going to find is that once you go out to the industry as one, you're going to be constantly working with your coworkers and, and bosses and, and other people in the industry trying to get their input and trying to find out like, what is the thing that you actually want me to build? Um, because that's usually one of the hardest questions to answer in web development today, is what is the thing that you actually want to take on, right? It's like, I can do X, Y, or Z, but what do you want, what's gonna be best for your users, right? So, so that's one of those parts that is important is kind of understanding and learning how to communicate about requirements and what the expectations are. And is this good or is this bad? Is, should I take this approach or should I take that approach, right? And those are things that sometimes, you know, you can have a good intuition about what that's going to be. But especially if you don't understand the industry, which more than likely is going to be the case, you need somebody else's input to kind of know how the industry works, right? So, like, I worked in the biomed industry, biomedical industry. I don't know a lot of biomed. Right? I don't know how they how things happen with doctors and how it works in the hospitals and all those kind of things. So I have to ask those questions so I understand kind of the world that they're coming from so I can build software that works well for them in that world. Does that make sense? Um, because it's very easy to have some misunderstandings about what you think happens and what actually happens, and that can make a very big difference to, to how you write the code and what you write in the first place, okay? So one way to get habit with that is to ask questions, is to continually be asking, how can I make this better? Are there any issues that you see with this? When you say this requirement on the page, what do you actually mean by that? Um, when I write my requirements for my projects, um, 
I don't always give you all the details. That's intentional. Okay, I'm not always going to give you all the details of what you want, what I want you to build. I'm going to leave some things a little bit vague. I'm going to leave some things open for interpretation for a few reasons. One, I want to have you have a little bit of creative freedom, some amount of creative freedom to kind of come up with a solution for it because that's something we do in the industry all the time is we need to come up with creative solutions to problems. It's also an opportunity for you to ask a question and say, this is how I'm interpreting that. Is that the same way that you see? Right? And so, so sometimes there's a little bit of vagueness in the project requirements and the project spec because, and that's intentional because that's what we see in industry. Does that make sense? More than likely, whoever you're working for, whoever's telling you, this is the software, this is the thing I want, doesn't actually know what they want. And in fact, they might change their, their mind in the next two weeks. Right? That happens all the time. I've seen so many cases where it's like, okay, we built what you had asked you for, you asked for, and then we find out a week or two later that, well, maybe you wanted something different. So, so that's important, right? To get in that habit of asking me, asking other other students, like, what do you think of this? Is this is this a good choice, right? Is this a good approach to the UI, right? Is this a good approach to, to making it usable? Um, so that's that's something that you should be asking for. Even if you think you have all the answers, even if you think your software is perfect, it's a good thing to go and ask, right? It's a good thing to go ask for input. And then, of course, the other flip side of that is if you're asking for input, you've got to apply that input. You've got to take it and you've got to in, improve your program using what you want. Um, in terms of, you know, we talked a little bit about the flip classroom model. That means you really do need to take a look at the stuff on perusal, mostly the reading assignments, and there's some videos in there as well, and make sure you do those before class so that we can really have a productive discussion given that you kind of have that foundation of like you kind of understand where we're going. Cool? Um, if you're missing out and, and falling behind on the reading or if you're not doing it before we talk about it, it's going to be a lot harder for us to be productive in that discussion about the reading if you've got no clue what's what we're talking about. And that usually means that you're going to be just sitting there and, buh, 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 and you have no idea what we're talking about and you're missing out on valuable information. Okay, so that's really, really important. Um, so make sure you're reading those, those online materials. Um, there are going to be some cases where even the you know, the materials there are only giving you a part of it, or there's additional information that you need to go do, need to go and do. And specifically, that means, hey, go read things beyond just the textbook, beyond just what's on perusal. Go, go search out um, online documentation to fill in some of those gaps. In fact, there's some places on the calendar already where I've got that filled in where there's, there's some things that I can't easily get into perusal. So you're going to have to kind of look them up separately online and kind of read through the documentation about those particular concepts. Um, so we'll talk about that as we get to them. But there are a lot of valuable resources online in terms of reading where you can learn a lot more beyond even just the, the kind of the textbook, the reading materials that we have. Um, another good way to kind of get a deeper understanding of a lot of these concepts is to pick up a, a kind of a small hobby project, do little projects outside of class that kind of help you get more practice with the things that we're going to be doing. Right? That's another way that you can kind of delve deeper. Building things is a really good way to start to see the things where you maybe thought you understand the material, but didn't. Um, usually when people start building actual projects, they find out, oh, there's something in here I didn't realize. Um, or, oh, there's something I thought it worked this way, but it actually works this other way. Um, that happens really, really often. Or, it used to be this way, but it's this way now, right? Things are constantly changing. Things are constantly evolving. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of misunderstandings. So sometimes the best way to dig through all that is just to build something and see how it works for yourself. Cool. Is that kind of helpful? Kind of some some tips as far as what to do. Again, asking for help. I'm try to do as much as I can to cycle through and get everybody. You know, we've got a good sized class here, so 
it's going to take me some time to kind of get used to that and make sure that we're all, you know, getting everybody in a day because um, these projects get big. It's not unusual for, unfortunately, at the scale where we're talking about full-blown web apps. It's not unusual for me to need to spend 30 minutes plus with somebody to kind of get past whatever hurdles you're at. So if I'm sitting too long with somebody, you know, you can try to get my attention so I can kind of try and move around, but just a fair forewarning that sometimes things just take time. Cool. Um, just because there's a lot that goes into projects of this size. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the syllabus. I'm going to pull the syllabus up and we'll kind of go through some of the different parts. All right. I'm going to go back to Inside Rankin. I'll pull up the syllabus here. Uh, I need to get to my course. Log back in. So the syllabus is like the second item from the top. There we go. So all the details there. We've seen some of this thing. We're going to be Monday through Friday is our schedule. Um, 1235 to 425, and we've got 80 sessions this semester. And we'll be meeting in uh, G2, this room, G203. I think on the version of this that I put up on perusal, it's actually incorrect on the room number. It says G203, or G205, but it's actually G203. Um, if you do need to get in touch with me, um, there's my uh, cell phone number as well as my email, my work email, uh, that you can get in touch with me. Usually the quickest way to get in touch with me, though, is through Discord. Um, Discord, I've got it on my phone. I get notifications. So that's usually the, the fastest way for me to turn around and, and give you an answer. Um, I don't tend to answer Discord necessarily over the weekends or late at night. Um, so you might see my answer the next morning when I come in. Um, it's worth noting I do have office hours. I am mean, actually here from 8 in the morning to 4.30 or 5 o'clock usually. Um, so I am here in the morning. Um, I usually do have other things going on, such as building out curriculum and grading and those kind of things. So if you do want to get a hold of me outside of class, you know, usually we need to schedule that and set up some sort of meeting so that we can kind of fit that in. I know when you're coming. Um, but if you do need help, with something outside of class, I'm, I'm generally available. Cool? Um, yes. Yes, I've got some instructions for how to do that. They'll give you the link. I think that that document is on, uh, that document, there's a link to it on Inside Rankin, and there's also a link to, there's also in Perusal as well. So we'll get to that. Um, as far as reading assignments and such, um, that's all going to be provided for the original. So maybe the, the thing we should do at this point uh, is before I finish this whole syllabus is maybe we need to get everybody over on perusal and get you start using that. So I think that's maybe what I'm going to do and then we'll kind of come back and we'll finish up the review of this. So what you want to do is you're going to go back to Inside Rankin. There's a link here. You're going to go to perusal.com and you're going to register for an account. Okay, um, there's a course code here. Um, you can also take a look at here how to use perusal. Page one will help guide you through this process. Is is also kind of an introduction to that. So if you would. Either go log into your appraisal account if you created it already, or go ahead and sign one up so I can get everybody in the course. Okay. So it's 145. I'm going to get back into talking about some stuff here. So to give you just a quick orientation around the interface, um, so once you get logged in, you should see something like this. Obviously, you're going to see something different once you start reading the documents. Um, but back in here, um, and you can always get back out if you click on perusal. That will take you back up to this interface. So I'm going to work back down to our class. 
Uh, and so you see there's some tabs at the top. Mine is, looks a little bit different because I'm in as the instructor has a different UI than the student. Um, if I go, let me actually switch over to the student view for a minute. So I'm looking at it the same way as you guys are. There we go. So up at the top, this is kind of where you want to start, is at the top you'll see that there are, um, there's like an assignments tab and there's a library tab. Does everybody see that? So the assignments is where you're going to see all of the reading assignments that I've assigned, that have a due date, that have a grade associated with them. So everything in here, all of these reading assignments are going to get a grade between 0 and 4. Okay, 4 is the max score, 0 is the lowest score, and we'll talk a little bit about grading and how that works. But every one of those are kind of an assignment, and you can see the due dates. So like you can see all three of these are due when? What day are these three due? Tomorrow? Yeah, so tomorrow before class. Okay. And then the next ones, right, these are due Wednesday before class, etc. Uh, it's possible you can go all the way down to everything that I've listed. So you can see that there's documents and such going all the way out through September already. Not all of them are there, but that's kind of you can see some of the schedule there. Um, it's worth noting that these assignments stay open. Um, actually throughout the entire semester. So some of these are going to close uh, down and they're going to be collapsed up here as the semester goes on. But you can still go back and read them. Anytime you need to, you can go back out and, and read them. Uh, I think that the, if I remember right, there's a window where you get credit for reading. And I think it's set at two weeks. Once it's two weeks, you stop receiving any cre credit for it after the deadline. But in order to get full credit, you really need to submit it. You need to do the work, do the reading before um, before that deadline occurs. Does that make sense? So all of the these three you really need to do today. Okay. Um, so that's this is kind of the assignments view. So the assignments view is is those things that I've asked for you to read. Um, if you go over to the library tab here. Um, the library tab is where all of the files that I've uploaded live. Okay, so I upload them first to the library, and then they appear here for you as assignments as I've assigned them. So you can also kind of see through that view, see all the stuff that's up there, right? So I can look under classroom management. I can see those documents. I can look under my SQL, see some of the stuff that's there, etc. Um, so that can be a place to look, but more than likely you're going to want to go through the assignments pathway directly because that's that's where you're going to see those. Cool. So most of the time when you're working with Virgil, that's where you're going to focus is in this assignments area. Now, on the left, you'll also see there's a few other tabs and a few other pages. So for instance, I can go to my scores. If you go to that page here, you'll see that there's the assignments listed. And there's a column for your scores, right? So as the semester goes on, again, you'll start seeing scores up there appearing in the range of zero to four, right? So you'll be able to see the grade when it um, and, and so that's the way you can see kind of how are you getting assessed there. And in fact, when we get in there, it will actually tell us um, why did you get points that you got, right? So for instance, if I go into this document, I haven't opened it yet, so it says assignment not yet opened. Um, it's going to give me a tour, but let's go ahead and just get in here. Now, if I go, say, in here, I'm going to just highlight the word perusal like this. I'm just kind of dragging. Um, this is one of the things you can do. So let's say I highlight this, and I type in test. So I'm going to just type in something just there real quick to test it. That's put in annotation. Okay, so every annotation you can put in like that. You just highlight something and write whatever you want. Um, every annotation you do is going to get a score from 0 to 1, 0 to 2. So it can be a 0, it can be a 1, it can be a 2. We'll talk about why that is, what that means, but each of those will give you a score. Um, there's some automated grading in there where it automatically tries to guess that. I do have to go back afterward and correct it, so sometimes you'll see your grades go up and down as I go fix the automated grading. 
Um, but now that I've entered something, it should have shown up here, which it didn't. Does a score show up on anybody's screen? If you go to, if you go to the my scores, does anybody see a score? Okay, so let me do this. I'm going to go back, line, sign out, and sign in as. So now, there we go. Um, so once you have, once you start getting scores, these I don't generally release until after the due date. Um, but once you have that in there, you'll be able to see kind of a breakdown of how you got that score. So for instance, here you'll see it tops a total number of annotations. It says zero, right? So there's zero annotations that are important to that. And there's a little stock. So in order to get full credit for these assignments, there's a there's kind of setting in there. There's a threshold. Um, you need th what we call three annotations, three comments, um, in order for you to get the full four points. Does that make sense? So that's one part of that. There's a big part of that is annotations. It'll also kind of show you an average of what those annotations scored and kind of the distribution of that, that thing. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that grade. Um, part of that grade is the annotations that you do. That's the biggest part of it. Um, there's also points in there that you get for just time you spend reading. It doesn't actually keep track of how long you have the document opened and read it. It also tracks how many times you open it. Because one of the things that we see is that if you start doing the reading early, that leads to better uh, early and kind of piece by piece that usually leads to better understanding. So rather than trying to sit down last minute and read the whole thing, kind of pick it piece by piece, maybe read an hour here, an hour here, or 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, that means that you're going to keep reopening it, and that also gives you points. So there's a lot of different ways in here kind of in by actively engaging in the reading process, you'll get those, you'll get those credits. Okay? That makes sense? So that's part of what's going on here. Okay, so my scores is where you're going to see those grades. Notifications, you may see things pop up here. Mainly that's going to be when somebody else, say, replies or comments on your stuff. Um, you may get a notification about that, you know, or a discussion to kind of go back to. Um, you can write some notes in here if you want to have some private notes that not everybody sees. You can do that. Um, so you make notes on the text as well. Um, and those kind of things. So let's go back to the. Yep. Yes. Yes. In fact, if you read the document, it's actually described in the document okay. itself. Um, so that's kind of the, the introduction to the interface. So you know where the kind of things are. So the next thing I want to ask you to do is actually go read through this document. As you're reading through this document, does everybody see these, these little circles on the left? Okay. Those circles are all the other students that are in your class that are reading right now. So you can actually see that other people are reading at the same time that you're reading. You're actually reading together. Okay. So if you're if you're on at the same time, you'll see that. You know, and, and you can maybe discuss it, just talk about what you're reading. Okay. Um, but the main benefit here is kind of as you saw, I can highlight something and then I can write a comment. Right? We call this an annotation. Okay? And so it's kind of a social media sort of reading platform. Does that make sense? And so I wrote on a test here. Somebody else can come in and comment and, and continue that thread. Okay? So I'm going to get out of the student view. I'm going to get back to my... Um, back to my view as an instructor of it. So what I ask you to do at this point is let's just take um, some minutes. Uh, let's see, how many pages do we have here? Let's say there's five pages. Let's say let's take uh, 30 minutes here and give you a chance to read through this and play with the features, try to have some discussions. 
see how this works um, as you read through the document. So let's take the next 30 minutes. You can read through this and you can kind of talk with it um, about with with your classmates. Okay. So if I can bring you back and get your attention again, we'll kind of now you've gotten some intro to kind of how the tool works, how Perusal works. Hopefully you're starting to kind of understand where it fits in as far as this course is concerned. Um, a few things to note. Um, I, if you need more space, you can click the X here. That'll make the left sidebar go off to the off away like that. I find that very helpful to have gone. Um, and if you ever want to take a look at what other people are writing, you just got to click this all conversations and you'll be able to see all of the, the different conversations that have happened on that document. In fact, it's kind of grouped by page. So page one, page two, page three, and page four, page five. So you can kind of see what, what all is going on if you want to go look at the document as a whole. Um, so I'm going to jump over to the syllabus now and kind of look at that here. Okay, so let's start from the top. So we kind of talked about SIL perusal. That's how we're, our, we're going to work through this. Um, program level outcomes. Um, so these are kind of the goals of, of where we want you to be at um, when you finish the, the two-year program. You know, what are the things, the skills that you need to develop? So this is kind of the, the goals that me and Evan and such have come up with um, as far as what we're shooting for in all four semesters. And, a lot of it kind of correlates to different individual semesters. So first one being develop and design websites that use the latest versions of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and modern JavaScript libraries. So that would be what you did in kind of your first semester course, that intro to those. Um, troubleshoot and implement applications using object-oriented programming principles would have been your C-sharp, your second semester course. Um, and then we're here. Um, build data-driven web applications using JavaScript, Node.js, and database management systems. So that's where we fit in in this semester. Is That's our main focus. And then finally, use a version control system to manage your code. And so that means having a kind of centralized repo where you can commit it, and multiple developers can commit it, and kind of getting practice with that. With that, well, you've been learning Git, right? So Git is that version control system that we're learning and teaching it. You can kind of read the, the course description to kind of understand what this course is about. Um, our, we've got some kind of outcomes that we'd like you to get through this course. And so those are kind of some of the things that I'm shooting for to make sure you learn and know and you know, know how to do. So things in there include using CSS and Bootstrap to design responsive websites. That's still part of this semester. Um, still, because that's still part of what we want you to get out of. You kind of learned how to do it first semester, but you still need to know how to do that, still apply those skills, so there may be some review involved to go back and relearn that, and we'll talk more about that at the end of the semester. Um, Node.js, Express.js, Modern JavaScript, we're going to be using those together to build web applications, as I've talked about. Um, we're going to be learning how to develop web forms that can post data to the server and get results back. So that's another part of this. You know, first semester you learned how to start writing forms, but all of the logic with, to that was constrained to the, the browser itself. So we're going to be building forms that can actually send data to the server. The server can do whatever processing with it that we want and validation and, and all those kind of things. And then when it gets done, send the results back. And so you've got kind of JavaScript actually on both end, both sides. You've got front-end JavaScript where the form sits and back-end JavaScript, which is where you're sending it to. So we're, we're going to see both of those, those layers. That's part of what we're doing here. Um, also to use a database management system to persist, manipulate, and query user data. Um, this week we're going to talk about a database called MySQL and focus on talking about um, relational databases and the SQL language and then in about a week, we're going to jump over and talk about MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database. So it's a little bit of a different hierarchy, a different um, view model of working with databases, um, but it's actually really, really cool and, and pretty easy to learn. So that's where we're going to sit with that. Most of our work will actually be with Mongo, um, but we're going to start doing with uh, MySQL first. And then also build web APIs. 
web APIs are things that on the back end you can call. You can kind of think of it as a group of functions. So you can kind of call this function from your front end, and it can do things, and then you can return the results back. Um, so we'll be building APIs for that, and we'll be calling them with something called Ajax. You may have learned a little bit about Ajax in the first semester. I think we didn't get to it this summer, just because of time constraints. So I'm like, well, I'll just we'll cover it when we get here. Um, so that will be primarily through something called the Fetch API, which is a new newer API in browsers. So talking about policies, um, the attendance policy um, is a little bit different this semester than maybe what you've seen. Um, we are basically going back to our traditional in-person model with a few slight modifications. Um, last year we suspended this and we went to primarily a hybrid model. I think that's where most of you guys were last year is, is we were kind of doing most of our work online, most of our work remotely with the option to come in, right? Um, and so that's kind of where we were last year. That's not where we are today. So um, attendance in person this semester is required, is expected. Um, this is going to run as a regular seated course, uh, which does mean that I want you here every day, you know, in person. You know, the, the attending remotely isn't really an option. So just to read some of the verbiage, though, that is new, it says uh, to prevent students from feeling pressured to attend seated courses in fear of exceeding allowable number of absences during the present. During a pandemic, the procedure for enforcing the attendance policy for seated face-to-face -face course will be modified a bit um, for the fall 22, uh, 21 to 22 semester. Um, and the attendance procedure is as follows. Okay, so there's this is mostly the normal attendance procedures that we would do pre-pandemic um, with some changes. Um, so let's talk about what the attendance policy is now. So the allowable number of absences is based on how many sessions we have. We have 80 sessions. Um, so that puts us at six um, allowable absences. We can have up to six. If you get to seven absences, then you get dropped from the course. Okay. So that's, that's where that sits. Um, realistically, we don't want you anywhere near six. If you're near six, then that means you've missed all six days, and that's going to be pretty, put you pretty far behind. So your goal should still be to try and be here every day, but there's a little bit of leeway if things come up, family issues or other such, you know, sickness, illness, whatever, um, transportation problems, all of those kind of things fall in there. There's some grace if, if things come up, okay? Um, one thing I would ask, if something comes up and it means that you can't make it to class, I need you to let me know, um, ideally before class starts that you're not going to make it, um, or at least that day, so I know why you're gone and, and what's going on, and, and that way we can kind of make a plan to work around it and catch up with the material that you may have missed, okay? So it's really important for me to know, you know, that you're not going to be there and, and uh, why you're not there to kind of make a plan. It says... Um, canceled course sessions and holidays don't affect those absences. So we've got four holidays that land in this semester, I think. Uh, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and then there's two days for Thanksgiving. So those don't count. And those are just days where we're not meeting. Um, as far as this semester is concerned, um, there are what we call tardies in the system. So if... A, let me just read the terminology. Um, arriving after the scheduled start time or leaving before the scheduled end time will result in a, in a tardy designation for attendance. So a tardy is defined as a period of up to 10 minutes during the scheduled class time when a student is not present. Okay. Now that is doesn't have to be a consecutive 10 minutes. That can be 10 minutes spread around, but it's 10 minutes, right? So that means that... Um, up to 10 minutes. If you're, let's say you show up at, class starts at 12.35, if you show up at 12.37, you're two minutes late, you'll be counted tardy. Okay, but if you show up at 12.45, 
right? 12.45 is 10 minutes after class starts, you're going to mark absent for that day. Okay, if you're more than, if you're 10 minutes or more late, you're going to be marked absent instead of tardy. So tardy is only for a very short window. Uh, the way tardies work um, is every two tardies counts as an absence. Okay, so that's how that functions. Um, you really don't want to get those. Cool? Um, those weren't in force last, last year because of us primarily doing things hybrid. It didn't make sense. There wasn't a practical way to enforce starting, so we didn't have them. But now we have them again because we're kind of trying to move more back to in-person classes. Um, one way around that and the kind of recommendation that I think Evan gave to the, the first semester class coming in is to try and be 30 minutes early. And so if you try to be 30 minutes early, more than likely whatever happens with traffic or other things on your way in shouldn't be an issue. You're going to be on time most of the time if you plan to be 30 minutes early. Um, I know that a lot of people tend to eat, as far as we're in, in the afternoon, a lot of people tend to eat lunch between 12 and 12.30. That's okay. I do that as well. Okay. Um, but that just means you have to kind of be aware of that. Right. It means that you may... Um, and sometimes I have to do this as well and get better at it, but if you have lunch between 11.30 and noon instead of 12.30, 12 and 12.30, if you have the option to do that, that's going to mean that more, less, more likely you're going to be able to make it in on time. Cool? So, you know, just plan your schedule. You know, try to arrive early. Um, this classroom is always open um, because there's a morning class before here, so you can, you can come in here as early as noon. Um, and get set up. Okay, um, that's what I would recommend to make sure you're not late. Um, now, under the case that you have been, if you are placed under quarantine um, by the Indian Academic, Academic Affairs, which would be Shannon, um, or the local health department, um, you're going to be allowed to participate online. So if something comes up and you need to be quarantined, because of COVID, then you then there will be an option to be remote. Now, that means a few things. How could you come into quarantine? Well, one of the ways is that is if you ever test positive for COVID, well, obviously you're under quarantine. Uh, if anybody that you were in close contact with gets tested positive, then you're also under quarantine. Um, so it's not necessarily just that you have um, have um, a positive test, but if somebody in your close circle has a positive test, you should be staying home. Cool? So that would be like the same with like, like some of the like, Yes, um, absolutely. Well, like, like, so I said, it work, some of the work, like, is quarantined. Is that like Yeah, so that's a good question. So if, if somebody in your house tests positive, or has a relationship with them, but if they, whether it's a roommate or a spouse or a child, then you should absolutely quarantine. You should tell me, we'll pass it up the chain. Um, but you need to stay home basically for two weeks um, if if that happens. Okay. Now, if you're so that's like if your spouse tests positive or your roommate tests positive, then definitely. If your um, spouse, on the other hand, is is kind of second degree. Like if it's if their coworker tests positive, then we'd still like to know. We'd still like to be aware and in the loop of those kind of things, but that doesn't put you on quarantine. So it's only if it's there's a direct one step between you and the positive test test where we where we specifically say yeah you need to stay home. Does that make sense? So if that happens, if there's if if that requires you to miss class, we'll make it up. We'll figure something out. Um, we'll we'll make online assignments. Uh, for you to make that right cool so so that's one of the things that has been changed there's some leeway there if things come up um, then you just need to let me know you just let me know, let me know it's like you're testing positive somebody you know is testing positive somebody you live with is testing positive those kind of things so that I can I can kind of pass it up the chain and we can make arrangements um, so if you are in a quarantine situation, you're going to be able to submit your work online, um, whether that be through perusal, whether that be through um, 
inside Rankin, whether that be through GitHub, there's plenty of ways to do that. Um, if there's a test day that you end up missing because of that, we'll, we'll figure that out and we'll reschedule the test or we'll, we'll give it all. Cool? So that's just, you know, something to be aware of. Um, if something, you know, if you submit work um, during that time, you'll still be marked present. This, again, this only applies if you're on quarantine. This doesn't apply if you're out for some other reason. You'll still be marked present. If you don't submit any work, you'll have to mark it out. Um, so this is, that's kind of the special exception to that. Um, and then if, if being on quarantine, this process leads to you missing up, getting past that six numbers of allowable absences, um, there's also some policies in place to try and um, to allow you to stick and stay stay in the course. Um, so again, if you were, it, you just it's just a matter of keeping me on the loop. And so if you get to that point where you need to meet, meet, miss a week or miss two weeks, then we'll work through you work through it, and we'll kind of figure out a solution, make it work. Um, and then as far as um, those kind of things go. Um, you're going to be, students will be allowed to make up reasonable um, academic work missed due to an absence. And this, this part is larger than just quarantine. If you for some reason need to miss class, if there's something that comes up, again, let me know. We'll make arrangements. It's not unusual that I give a makeup test. So it, sometimes people miss test days. We just schedule another day to take the test. Cool? Um, I don't do too much with moving homework and quiz, you know, homework and lab dates. I, I have some flexibility um, for that, um, but usually these are, you know, especially lab assignments are usually spread out of multiple days. So if you're missing that, then it's usually more than just you miss one day. Okay. So talking about academic dishonesty. Um, or academic honesty, rather, either one. Um, so it's really important to us that we don't have cheating occurring, that we have honesty happen, that you're doing your actual work. Um, that's really, really important for us to be able to stand back behind you and say, yes, this is a good student. He did well. He knows what he's saying, and you should hire him, right? If we can't if we can't if we can't enforce that if we don't know that you're taking somebody else's work and using it as your own that dial you know kind of waters down our ability to say that right about you if we don't know that it was work that you did if it's wasn't your own okay so we really 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 don't want you to cheat we really want you to learn the material and, and demonstrate your understanding of it okay um, a lot of times what I see people do is they go, okay, well, the deadline's X, and so therefore the only way for me possibly to meet that deadline is I'm going to cheat. And what you find, what, what happens then, well, I have to give you a score of zero, and at the end of the day, you didn't learn the thing you needed to learn, which then hurts you again and again and again because you never learned that fundamental piece. Um, it's always better to miss that deadline than to cheat on that deadline. Because what happens is usually when people miss a deadline with me, I just extend the deadline. And I just say, hey, okay, I understand it. This came up. All right, I'll give, you know, you have another day to do it. Um, and at that point, you've learned the thing. You've demonstrated it, right? It's, it's always better to take that approach. Right? It's always better to say, hey, I missed the deadline or make some sort of arrangement there rather than pushing and, and submitting somebody else's work. Cool? Um, so this is this is really kind of really kind of important for me. So question. Is copying code from Stack Overflow considered plagiarism? Yes. Most of the time yes. Um, now let me let me explain that a little bit. Um, I myself do look at Stack Overflow. And a lot of professional developers do. Okay, so it's not bad to look at Stack Overflow. Okay, a lot of people do it. A lot of professional people do it. It is a resource. Okay, the problem is 
when you take that code blindly or those solutions blindly, that's where it becomes an issue. Okay, it's okay to look, but the question is what you do next. Okay, so when when I'm looking up things at Stack Overflow, one of the things that I that I don't do is I say, oh, that looks like a solution copy paste. That's where you've got plagiarism happening. Okay, if you're copying and pasting code, even if it's one line of code, it's probably plagiarism. Okay, um, so that's the that's the kind of gotcha, right? If you're looking at and you're looking at Stack Overflow to get some understanding and some explanation of how things work, or figure out why you're having a bug, why is it throwing this exception, and you're gaining some more fundamental understanding from it, then it is an amazing tool. Okay, it is an amazing tool if you're looking for more explanation of things. And there's a lot of things that honestly, that's the only place where the answer exists on Stack Overflow which is why us professionals do use it a lot because there's a lot of things that we run into. It's like, well, the documentation doesn't say what the answer is, doesn't explain what's going on here, but somebody else has figured it out. Um, so the trick is just making sure that when you're reading through that, you're not just going like, oh, here's a line of code, let me just try that. It's read the answer, see what they're saying, see if you can understand what's going on, and then apply that understanding not to copy code blindly. Does that make sense? The biggest place where I see this be a problem is anytime we talk about things like regular expressions. Um, regular expressions are a way to, in one line of code, condense a lot of logic and a lot of specific things into it. And so that one line of code contains a lot of information. Okay, And so if you take a regular expression from online and, and paste it into your code, I'm sorry you have no idea what a regular expression is or why that's a problem or what the issues with that are because there's so much dense information in that one line of code. Okay, does that make sense? So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, right? And so what I'm looking for, right, if it's something that feels like, um, if it's something that feels like it's on the edge and you're not sure about it, probably don't do it. Or at least put a link in your code. You can put a comment in there and put a link that says, this is where I found it. Because at least if I have a, a link in the code that says, this is where I found it, then I can look at that and say, oh, okay, that's where you got it, fine. I'm more likely to give more leniency if I have a link to the Stack Overflow. <laughs> Um, then if I just find it and then I find it on like five students gave me the this answer but it's not connected to what we did in class then it looks very suspicious but if I have a link to where, where your source material is they can say okay I understand that absolutely go for it right so if if you're gonna pull something or you learn something from Stack Overflow I'd strongly recommend that you put a link to it in your code cool that's one of the big things that I'd ask. And, and if I have a link, automatically there's going to be more leniency because I know where it came from. <laughs> right? And, and then I kind of understand where that goes. Um, but it's, it's, it's that, that's one of those things. That's one of those things that you really have to use it the right way. Right? You want to use it in a way where you're using Stack Overflow to under, gain more understanding, not to like bypass the understanding process. And I can usually tell um, which of those two it is just by looking at people's general code flow. It's like, okay, I see you have this kind of understanding or I can talk to you and kind of understand who that is. Okay. Um, one very important sign for this course, okay. Um, one of the things that we do in this course is not just write code. Uh, we're also going to do some work with making designs, um, whether those be um, designs for your database or whether those be designs for the UI, balsamic mockups and such. Those kind of things are really, really important. In fact, your database mockup, your database design, is in some ways more important at tantamount to code. Okay, it's just as important to code. Um, in fact, I'm liable to be more 
It's more severe if you copy somebody's database design than if you copy somebody's code, in fact, um, because there is so much that goes into that and, 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 and that kind of thing, plus all of your code's built on top of that design. So I really want to stress when we're doing these designs, ERD diagrams and, and mock-ups and wireframes, those need to be your own original work. You need to be creating those from scratch, completely from scratch. Um, and not checking in with how other, other people have done it. It needs to be all your original idea. Right? You need to build that and design that and, and come through that. Um, I had one case um, a year or so ago, a year or two ago, where I had a group of students who worked on the same design together and then submitted it as their own work. And obviously, that's plagiarism. And, and to them, that didn't seem like a big deal, but it is a really big deal. Like, that design is really, really important. Okay? So let me stress that. Okay? So I, this, this applies not to just the code you write, but to anything you're turning in, specifically designs even more. Okay? Um, and honestly, as far as designs can, are concerned, please don't show them to any. If you're going to make a database design, you're going to make a UI mock-up, Please don't show it to any of your classmates. Please keep that to yourself. Okay. There are some acceptable cases for sometimes when you're working with with people um, on code, and, and that's that is a fine line. But there's really no space when it comes to designs. The only people that should be seeing your designs are you. um, because it's just too easy for that to be stolen. It's way too easy to steal an idea from a design and not come up with that yourself. Cool? Inception. Huh? Inception. Yeah. Because the inception of that is, yes, exactly, one of the most important parts of the process is coming up with it. So that's that's really important. And that's going to be the key for you. Okay? Um, and, and if I do find that, that case where you've got designs that have been copied, that's a case where you're going to find yourself restarting the project from scratch because it's that big deal. Um, so sharing code over Discord, there's no accessible, there's no acceptable scenario for that. If you're uploading code, whether it be Discord or anywhere online, there's there's no acceptable level of that. There's no like here I'm going to upload uh, one file or just this one. One piece. Any case of that is is not okay. Cool. Are we clear on that? Um, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna look at somebody's code, if you're gonna work somebody, I, I generally prefer not to have you looking at somebody else's code. But if you are gonna do that, then do it over like a stream, like screen sharing kind of thing. We're looking at another person's screen because there's no case where there's no case where even just any there's, there's no acceptable line where even any small part of code can be uploaded. Cool? Um, if there's something you feel you really need, um, maybe from an example, for instance, that I've done, then talk to me, and I'll, and I'll give you the code for my example. Uh, please don't try to get that from another student. Um, we talked about Stack Overflow, like Googling. Yes, Googling and online resources are great. It's just the, the direct copy and pasting is the problem. Okay. It's the I didn't come up. I don't understand the co I don't understand the stuff, and um, I just copied and pasted it from somewhere rather than coming up with it um, yourself or kind of go going through the the reading and understanding. Oh well, I need to use this function. Right? So maybe you find out, hey, I need to use the filter function or the map function or the sort function and figuring out how those things work. That's good. Cool. So, so basically when we get into cases, if it's, you know, if the work that you're submitting is a clear copy of code that's found online, it's you. Right? If it's very clear that, oh, well, this is, this is where you found it, this is the thing. You know, I found the same project there. That that's hands yeah, down to. Um, if it's a clear copy of another student's work, it's also to. Um, that's the case where I find um, even just this last year, I had a 
at a group of students where um, three different students have an identical part of their code. It's like this should not be identical, but it nested, it's like, well, you've got these two or three lines that are the same. These, these, these similarities shouldn't exist. They wouldn't exist naturally. Um, so do I always catch those cases? No, not always. But sometimes students try to cover up their tracks and you know it comes down to just unfortunately sometimes the evidence I'm working off is two or three lines, but that's really all we need. Um, because that's all we have to go off to use with. Cool. So I just I ask that you don't do it, right? Create the code yourself. Um, make it all make it all yourself. Definitely research online. Definitely look at it, things that are out there. But it's really important to write it from scratch. Cool. Any questions? Does that kind of answer that? This is stuff that I wish I really didn't have to deal with and talk about the fine lines of things, but it comes up all the time in this class specifically um, that that happens really often. Okay. Um, if there is a case of you know, any signs that there's plagiarism or cheating, that's going to give you a score of zero on that assignment and a score of zero for anybody that's involved. So let's say three people submit the same code. Well, all three of those people are going to get the same zero. Um, it also traditionally has come with a does not meet. Um, if, you, if, if you're found guilty of that, if you're cheating at first, that results in a DNM at the end of or your work that goes right. Um, a second and third offense can lead to you being um, dropped from the course or potentially dropped from the college. Okay, it's something that we treat pretty harshly. Okay, so again, please don't do it. If there's a fine line there and you're saying, "Hey, I found this thing on Stack Overflow. Can I use it?" Well, there's two things you can do. You can ask me. I will gladly answer your questions on. Can I use this thing from Stack Overflow? I can give you a for sure answer one way or another. Is that cheating? And at least give me a link. If you're going to use something from Stack Overflow, at least give me a link in the code so I can at least track it down. Cool? Or wherever else you find it. You know, If I know where it's available online, then I can see and compare your code to it and I can see things that you've done to make it better or things that how it's different and I can also see oh okay if I see that same the other thing that happens if you link it then I can see if multiple students have gotten it from the same place if that makes sense so that also that also helps me cool in fact more than likely if I see five people linking to the same resources on Stack Overflow, I'm probably going to look at that and say, oh, this is really great, and share it with everybody. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, if you find something cool, share it. Um, but, but please share it to me at least to direct message before you post it on Discord. That's one thing I would ask. So I can at least look at it first. Um, so general course grading, how your, 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 course, your grades break down, 30% um, of your grade is going to be on reading and homework, and so that's predominantly going to be these perusal assignments. That's 30% of your grade. Um, labs in the final project are 40%. Um, traditionally, I've had the final project broken up as 10% of your grade as a separate 10%, but I'm lumping it into the labs this time because we're going to work on that final project through a lot of these lab assignments. Okay, um, So rather than having it be something separate, um, it's going to be part of that same thing. Um, as far as exams, then you've got 30%. And those exams are going to be a mix of theory and hands-on stuff. Okay, So they're going to kind of vary in there. Any questions on, on that so far? So you got the grading scale. Grading scale hasn't changed from previous semesters. Um, things to kind of think here. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely drink water. Um, so if we're thinking about here, um, 
kind of the way the hours break down. Um, we'll have about 120 hours still in class doing lecture and things like that like we're doing today. Um, we're going to have about 240 hours spread out over the class doing, doing projects and that'll be in shop and in class. Uh, and then out of class, this is the big part that you're responsible for, is I do expect you to do a good amount of reading, namely reading and homework predominantly through um, through perusal, and if there's any quizzes, I'm more than likely to put up a few quizzes on, on inside rank, and that would include that as well. Those are things you're expected to do predominantly the reading is going to be out of class. And then I also expect you to do a certain amount of working on the project out of class as well. Does that make sense? Um, how this usually breaks down is it's kind of a minimum, it's about two hours on average, I believe, per day we're in class. So you say, hey, we're four days, we're four hours per day in class, you're going to need to spend two hours per day, kind of as your average out of class doing reading and working on projects. Cool? So those are kind of the, the expectations there. Um, I do allow late work to be submitted. Um, I do have some flexibility there where I, as I said, you know, if things come up, I, I'm usually pretty gracious about moving deadlines back a day or two if something happens. Um, you are still expected to complete all the reading assignments by the due date. Um, I don't have much flexibility on that, right? The, the reading assignments need to be done beforehand so we can talk about them, so we can discuss them. So I don't have a way, I don't really take late work in that sense in terms of reading assignments. You can still comment them, and after they're due, you still input annotations, and you will get some amount of credit, but more than likely you may not get full credit if you do it after the due date. Okay. Um, and as that time goes on, the penalty in, in perusal goes up. Right? The later it is, the more the more it gets penalized. So again, if you submit it before the due date, then you don't have to worry about it. You get full credit. Everything's good. Um, as far as lab assignments go, I take lab assignments up to one week after the due date. Um, if it's more than a week after the due date, forget it. Um, whatever grade, whoever you turned in, that's, that's what the grade is. Right? Um, in general, as I say here, I take a 10% penalty for each day that it is late, um, not counting uh, that. Yeah. So there's, it's intended to be pretty lenient. You know, I had to put something in here to at least keep it from being, I don't want you to wait until the end of the semester to turn it in, but I have some leniency in there because honestly, I'm trying to reflect um, the way the workforce is. And the workforce, has a certain amount of leniency on deadlines. When you're talking about software development, web development, most of those deadlines aren't hard and fast, but there is a point where hey, it's too late, right? A week is a week is pretty far behind. It's also just a matter of if you're turning in things a week behind, you're pretty far behind where we are in the course already. So again, there's some leniency in there, and that also means I, I'd much rather have you um, I'd much rather have you turn in an assignment late than cheat on that assignment. Does that make sense? Because if you cheat on the assignment, it's a flat out zero. If you, it's a little bit late, it's probably going to be 10 or 20% off. Cool? I'd rather have you learn the material than, than cheat on the material. So usually what this means, and this is why I why I say this, if I can't download it and run it, um, usually this is a case that you haven't uploaded to get. Um, I get a lot of cases where people forget to, before they leave, leave class that day, they forget to upload it. And so then I can't grade it when I'm trying to grade everything, grade everybody else's assignments. So it kind of falls back later in the queue because I don't have it the time when I'm grading everybody else's. Um, so that's one of the things to do, is make sure that when you're, you know, if you make sure that you're regularly committing things to get and getting it up there, then that's good. Um, but effectively, if it's not uploaded, I have to treat it as that. Does that make sense? That's usually the problem, is it just hasn't been uploaded. 
or the rare case where I can't get it to run at all because you've uploaded all except one file, and I need that one file to make it run. That happens too, right? So, so those are the kind of things that, that that's why I why I say that. Cool. Um, Hands-on tests. Those I really, really, really need to upload the code on the day of the test. And the reason I need you to do that is because there are timestamps in there. And so if you upload it at that day, then I can see in Git what date and time that it's been uploaded. So I really, really need to have that happen on the day of the test, not the next day. Right? I need it to be that. So as far as labs, I do take that, but I don't I don't take late work for tests. Because they past that point, I don't know if it's your fault. Um, so you just really make sure it's there. One way you can make sure it's there is you can always go to the GitHub website and you can see if your code is there. If it's there on the GitHub website, I can get it. It's not going to be counted as late. But if you go to the website and it's not there, well, obviously there's a problem with the way GitHub's working or you haven't uploaded it on your computer. Cool. So that's a good way to kind of check and make sure before you leave um, that day. Um, and I would really recommend making a habit of committing your code multiple times a day. That is really a good way to, um, it's a good preparation for the industry. Um, I, on average, when I'm sitting down and writing code, I will usually um, commit five to 10 times a day, uh, honestly. I usually commit five to ten times a day when I'm actively working on a project. Cool. Um, it's a good thing. I think, Don, you said in there, save often, save frequently and save often. Absolutely. You know, I when I play video games, I'm very much a safe scummer. <laughs> I will go around the corner and save, and then go around a corner and save, and then go around a corner and save. I save very, very often. Um, and I used to when I started when I started writing code, um, I kind of had the habit that I would only commit maybe once every two or three days, you know, sometimes. And especially in the workforce, that really hurts. That really hurts um, because the problem is you have all your other coworkers that are making changes, and if you're not committing those changes and putting in your changes and pulling them up, pushing them up, you're also not getting their changes, which means that every day you go without committing your changes is another day you're going without getting their changes. And more than likely, when you finally upload them, things that may not work because there's a conflict. There's, there's a mishmash where they made this change and you made this change, and now you have to correct it. So the more frequently you can make and commit changes, the less likely that you have to have a major problem with conflicts with other people that you're working with. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, if you're familiar with kind of version control, we have this idea of there's a main branch, which is kind of the master understanding of it. Uh, we can pull off other branches where you're working on different paths and your your commits can go to those different branches. Um, there's a few different ways to think about that. And, and so one of the kind of the simplest way is to say there's one main branch and everybody commits to the main branch. Um, and honestly, there's, there's still a bunch of companies that do that. It's really a way to kind of uh, live fast and, and furious and, and lots of risk because everybody's going into that same place and it's 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 very easy for things to get broken that way but that's actually what um, both of the companies I worked at did we had one branch <laughs> and everything went in there which meant that we had to be a little bit careful you know about when we commit things and we had things like um, polar um, code review so you would have to kind of have somebody else look at it before you could put it in there um, there's that other approach which you're going at is like, is there a dev branch? And so one way of thinking it that people do, they do like the main or the production branch and they do a development branch. That usually doesn't work all that well. Um, so I don't encourage, wouldn't encourage anybody to take that approach 
because what usually happens is there's just all sorts of things that go wrong and then you have discrepancies between those two branches and it gets worse and worse over time. So what we do instead usually is you have the main through branch and then as you need to push software out, then you create branches. So like if I need to release version 2, I make a 2.0 branch. If I need to release version 2.1, I release a 2.1 branch, make a 2.1 branch for that. So usually making branches as I'm making releases, or the other way to do is something called a feature branch, where you branch for every time you need to make a new feature. And so maybe if I'm working on like the shopping cart uh, of this web application, I might make a shopping cart branch, do my work here, and then when I'm done, we'll merge that branch back in and the shopping cart branch goes away. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, so. We didn't do any branches last two semesters. Yes. But uh, visually speaking, uh, what occurs when you go one direction and the people on the main branch are still altering it? And you try to merge it and you don't have a result. Well, well you have to get them, right? So uh, when we're talking about branching, and, and let me be clear, we're not planning to be branching in this semester. It's beyond what I'm really able to do. I wish I could introduce you guys to branching. Um, but it requires a bit more of a team project than we've really been able to figure out how to do. Um, so you have your main branch usually here. If you go off and start making changes here, this is my branch, and this is main. So over time, there's things that are happening here. on the main branch that you don't have, right? And so these, these three circles, these are commits that somebody else has made but you don't have on your branch. Or you have two commits that nobody else has, right? So what you've got to do is what we call a merge, where you make another commit here and you basically pull those in in that merge and get it back in the same. Yeah, that's where then you start seeing conflicts because this, there may be disagreement between what happens over here and what happened in this pathway. And so that usually requires a bit of manual work to go through change by change, conflict by conflict, to figure out how am I going to resolve that. Uh, and sometimes that's as easy as pick option A or option B. Sometimes it's like, well, I want to pick both. And other cases, and I've run into plenty of these, it's like uh, neither of these will work because things have changed so fundamentally that I need to scrap both of those versions and make a new version that works with the combination of the two. And then you kind of call that like a manual merge sort of situation. So that's, that's kind of what happens, right? And that's really a, a big side channel. But, but that is an important thing to kind of get some practices with. Um, unfortunately, the only way to really practice that is to work with another team, is to work with another team member. Um, you can't really practice branching on a solo project. You have to have at least two people. Cool? Um, and so really, if, like, if you have a single person project, you should be using one branch. So, and does that answer your question too, on that, as far as that goes? So, um, and one thing, I, so I say, you know, commit is, is, commit often, commit multiple times a day is a good thing. Um, I would really recommend you commit it even if it's not done. Even if it's not done, just go ahead and upload it. I'm only going to grade the last word if you turn it in before you do one. Then I don't care if you've submitted, turn it in 20 times before the deadline. I'm just going to check that one last one. Okay. And I like to see how you got there, right? Because there's a lot of stuff that I can read from um, how you got there um, as far as that goes and, and seeing that you're making progress. But unfortunately, there's usually enough data in there that I can't track all of that. But it actually does, it is one of those things that I look at. Anytime I see cheating or plagiarism happening, I do actually go look at your commits. And I do try to see in the history where things occurred. And so 
if I see one giant commit that's got a bunch of code, I'm going to be extra suspicious about it, right? Because that more than likely means it wasn't your code, right? But if I see you over a two-week period, here's a piece, here's a piece, here's a piece, here's a piece, here's a piece. Well, obviously you were working on it. Does that make sense? Right? If I see an incremental buildup, well, then it's it's more of an indication that it's your work and not somebody else's work. Um, so that helps. Um, does that kind of make sense for everybody in terms of committing regularly? That's a really, really important thing to get practice with. Um, so let's talk about policies here a little bit. Um, there's been a bunch of, there are a bunch of new policies in the student handbook. I would really recommend you read through it. Uh, I don't want to go through all of those today. Um, maybe we'll look at it tomorrow. I definitely don't have any time to look at it today. Uh, but there's been some changes in terms of the dress code and other kind of things. So I really strongly uh, suggest that you go read that. Um, also, there's been a change in terms of smoking. Um, I think we allowed smoking in some designated areas in previous years, but we've we've limited it that now that you can't smoke on campus. And it's so like all things. smoking. All smoking, including vapor. So all of that's off limits on campus now. So there's a bunch of rules there. I would, especially in the dress code, I would recommend going and taking a look at it. If we have time tomorrow, I'll look at some of these things, but we don't really have time to do all that today. Um, so Let's just talk about the, I do want to talk about the IT department policies. Um, these have changed a little bit. Um, we get through, we get together as the IT department and look at these on a frequent basis and kind of make adjustments and changes to it as we see things. Um, so this last week we got together as an IT department and made some updates to these rules. Um, so let me kind of show, tell, tell you what these updated rules are. So number one. Um, for I, and again, these apply to all IT, not just AWD, but all IT students. Um, we don't want you to have any streaming videos, um, whether it be YouTube, sports channels, etc., unless it's for class. Okay, so you can watch video, but only if it's for class. So if it's related to programming, if it's related to what we're doing, if it's a video of uploaded to Perusal, absolutely by all means go watch that video. But if it's not related to that. I don't want to see it on your computer. Cool? Uh, so that includes things like watching video games, watching live Twitch streams. I don't want to see any of that. That's off limits. Um, and part of that actually comes down to there's limits on our bandwidth here in the IT department. Um, we only have so much bandwidth to go around for all of our classrooms. It's all shared between the whole IT department. So we need to not have you do that. Otherwise, it gets overloaded. Cool? If everybody does it at once. Um, video games are completely off limits um, for while we're in class because it's overarchingly we've seen it as a distraction. Um, that includes, you know, consoles. That includes computer games. That includes um, cell phone games. All of that. We, if if you're going to do it, take it out in the hallway, right? You play a game on your cell phone, you need to do it on the hallway, not in this room. And that includes even on breaks, okay? Even on breaks, I don't want to see you playing games, okay? Because um, we want to be able to focus on um, actually working through the lab and, and learning. And a lot of people don't necessarily take breaks at the same time, so what may be a break for you is maybe not a break for somebody else. So, it, you know, sometimes other people are working while you may be taking a break, so... I, I'd rather not have any of in my class because that's just going to be distracting to other students. Um, cell phones in general use. Um, you can you, you can have your cell phone out. You can use it as long as it's not distracting from the, the classroom environment as a whole, um, from the learning environment. So we don't want I don't want you out. Um, having them out during lectures, if you're going to use them, if you're going to take notes, I would recommend honestly the best way to take notes is on paper, um, because the biggest thing you get out of note taking is actually the physical writing it out. Um, it actually doesn't matter so much if you read your notes afterward. 
the most important thing with notes is actually physically going and writing and that's puts the mess muscle memory. So that's what I would suggest. You know, if we have lecture as we have lectures, I would I would recommend taking notes on paper. Don't take them on your cell phone, don't take them on your laptop, just pull out a piece of paper and write them down with a pencil or a pen um, is what I would recommend. Uh, if you do have a call, voice call or whatever, I know those are rare these days, but you do have one, I really need you to step out of the room and take it in the hallway, because um, otherwise it's just too distracting to take phone calls in the room. Um, we do allow earbuds, um, so you guys can listen to music while you're working on your labs and things like that, um, but we ask that you don't specifically use over-the-ear headphones because we need to be able to communicate with you and maybe call your attention to something that's going on. Um, otherwise, it can be just hard to get a hold of students when, when we need to announce something. Cool? So, headphones are good, but please stick to your earbuds, preferably ones that do kind of let you still hear what's going on. And if you can't hear what's going on with both ears in, then just do one. And that way, that way we can still hear. Uh, dress code wise, uh, we do expect all of our students to wear dress shoes. Okay, that's part of the idea of our rules. Um, so, what does dress shoe mean? Dress shoe, you know, includes you know, generally leather or or design. Um, one rule in here: dress shoes um, that extend past the lower part of the. Uh, past the lower part of the calf are not allowed. So that would include things that are up higher and need to be down lower. Um, that one's a little bit harder to judge and and whatnot, but what it is. Um, that generally just means no boots. That generally just means um, dress shoes and not boots. Um, tennis shoes and athletic sh shoes are generally not or just not required off across the board. Um, that's one thing for there. And work boots are not allowed. Okay. I think the one that we have the most problem with that is usually people wearing tennis shoes or, or similar is that's the case. Cool. Um, there's one rule on here. Jewelry must be removed if it's deemed a safety hazard. Um, that one actually, I think, Dawn, you'd asked about this one, about what that would mean. Um, the short answer to this one is it doesn't apply to us. Okay, so the, this is for the IT department as a whole, and one of the things that we teach in ID with a different with the regular IT pathway is there's a hardware classroom. Where in the hardware they're actually working with motherboards and other circuitry, and so if you had a big netlist or other things, maybe that could get in contact with that, and you could cause a short circuit, and that would be an issue not an issue here. So more than likely, you know, I don't know how in, in our specific industry that, that that would become a safety issue. Cool? So it's there. It mostly applies to the hardware classroom um, more than us. Does that answer your question, Don? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're just working with the software. It's very unlikely that anything that you're wearing, whether it be a necklace or a bracelet or earrings, it's going to cause any sort of damage. That's pretty unlikely. But it is a, it is entirely possible in other spaces. Um, another thing in here, um, as far as, you know, we're, we're watching where things are at in the pandemic. Um, so as far as fall 2021 is concerned, as far as the semester is, we will be wearing masks on campus the whole semester. Um, even, and this is this is under the IT department rules because what we've decided as an IT department, um, we don't know where things are going to go. We don't know where mask mandates are going to go. It, right now, there is a mask mandate in force for St. Louis City as well as Rankin as a whole has a mask mandate. If either of those drop, um, we're still going to be wearing class, wearing masks in class for the whole semester. That's our plan. Does that make sense? So regardless of whatever else happens politically, our plan is to continue wearing masks throughout the whole semester. Cool. And then we're going to reevaluate in spring, seeing where, where things are at, and, and we'll make a new decision in spring to decide mask or no masks. Cool.
So that's that's where that stands. Problem is there's been a little bit of instability with things in the region where it's gone this way or gone that way, depending on the waves of political opinion. So we want to kind of have a, here's the expectation, here's what we're going to be doing um, so that we have some predictability to our procedures. Cool. Um, one of the things we ask is, you know, we really do need to be following the CPC guidelines um, as you're wearing those. So there are guidelines in this pulled from the link. You can click on the CPC guidelines. That will take you to the actual page. Um, in terms of masks, you want to make sure that uh, there's at least uh, two layers of washable fabric. Um, that's preferred over, over using disposable masks, but disposable masks work too. Um, complete, they need to completely cover your nose and mouth. That's really the most important ones. If they're down here, if they're not covering both of those two things, they're not doing their job. The most important thing for them to do is cover both of those two things, both your nose and your mouth. They need to fit securely so you don't want to have a lot of gaps on the edges. Um, if you have a case where a mask is falling down, I'm going to ask you to um, you need to correct that, right? Get a different mask or whatever the case is. Get, adjust it so that it's not it's staying in place. Cool. Um, and here they suggest having a nose wire to print things leaking out there. Honestly, from my own perspective, I don't actually use masks that have a nose wire. I haven't seen it as being that helpful, um, and just most of mine don't don't have a nose wire. But that is the CDC recommendation. Um, in terms of things you don't want to do. Um, obviously, don't wear, don't wear ones that make it hard to breathe because you're going to be in this at least for four hours. So you want something that's good and breathable, um, so not vinyl. Um, and ones that have vents are not good. Um, and avoid the, the N95s because you want to save them for um, to emergency workers and such, healthcare workers. So that's kind of where that stands as far as department rules. So, Plan is we're going to have masks the whole semester, um, regardless of whatever else occurs. Um, inside ranking is we're going to find a lot of resources. You've seen I've already posted a bunch of links there to the main page. There's stuff under the coursework, but most of the stuff I post will be on uh, Perusal. There will be a lot of these reviews on Perusal. Um, if you're looking for tutorial assistance, you can get in touch with the SSC. I don't believe that we have a tutor, unfortunately, for this class. Um, that being said, if you turn out that you're interested in being a tutor for this class, get in touch with me, and maybe you can be, right? We do usually go through a little bit of checking to make sure that, you know, at least you're a little bit qualified. Um, but oftentimes for this class, the tutor tends to be in the class itself because there's really not an opportunity for us to get people that have or later in the process, right? You guys are the furthest in the the furthest in the curriculum that is here, right? The rest of my students have graduated, so so that's one thing to do. You can call, you can contact them, but um, at least at the moment we don't have a tutor. So if you're interested, in that, uh, if you do need any academic um, accommodations, talk to the SSC. They'll get the paperwork and, and necessary stuff from, from you and, and work through that. And then they'll let me know um, what you guys have kind of agreed on and arranged if there's anything that you need in terms of that, in terms of accommodations. Cool? And then we're just going to keep that between the two of us, basically, um, if you have those accommodations. Uh, career services, uh, this, is, this is definitely something you absolutely want to take advantage of. Take advantage of our career services. Far too many students don't use this, but it's really a good way to get prepared and work towards getting a job because they can help you in a whole host of ways, whether that be from you know, getting access to the job board and kind of seeing some of the postings that are in there and being able to loop on that, uh, to resume assistance, where maybe they can help you with writing the resume and, and editing it. Or I believe they also help with interviews and those kind of things interview prep and all those kind of things. So, so definitely give them a call at some point this semester um, so you can um, kind of get that home. Uh, 
snow days and campus emergencies. Um, the way that we do alerts for this is we use a system called OmniAlert. Um, the way that you sign up for that, you're going to go to Ensign Rankin. Um, and then under the top, you'll see there's a notifications tab. Everybody see that notifications tab on top? Um, you're going to need to go over here, notification sign up, rank and alert.net. That's going to take you through this. Uh, even if you've signed up for this already, go ahead and sign up for it again uh, because it's something you have to renew every year. So you're going to need to renew your subscription to it even though you signed up for it last year. This is the way that we send out notifications anytime there's a snow day or similar. What is it? What is it? Um, it should be your rank and username. Yeah, it should be your your the one you use for your email. So definitely make sure you're signed up for that uh, because this is the only way we post notifications. Um, if you're not on this system, like we don't post them on the news, we don't post them on anyone else. They're only through this system. Um, if you get signed up for it, you can actually. I get both a text message and an email anytime they send out an alert. So I can see it either way. And that's what I would recommend is get signed up for both. So, you know, it is a It's not unusual that we have one or two of these going into the the fall semester. They're a bit rare, but it does happen to so you want to be aware of that. We really don't I, I'd rather not have you um, driving on icy roads between home and campus if you don't need to. If it turns out class is canceled, you know, I think Rankin's threshold of you know how icy is too bad to cancel classes is pretty high. So it's hard to know without the notification, but I hate for you to drive in and then find out there's no classes. So say there's like a ice storm. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. class isn't canceled. Yeah. There would be a little more leniency if we're late to that ice Yeah, I would be more lenient. Okay. Like I know I've got pretty far. Yeah, forward. I know. I think some of you from my summer class, I think some of you are driving an hour to get in or close to it and so you know I, I understand that weather may be different between I get it so uh, I know that things happen but that's that's formally the way you know whether or not the classes are actually canceled. okay so make sure that you're on that because uh, that that way you get the okay so that's worked our way through the syllabus. That is a thunderstorm, I believe. Wow. Happening outside. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, so let's see, what do we talk through? Okay, so we talked through COVID safety guidelines or schedule. Okay. Um, So what's, let's see, what's for today? Okay, okay. So we need to talk about the course schedule, we need to talk about work like the grading, and then kind of get you going with that. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a quick break because we're at 3.30, or no, actually, yeah, we're at 3.30. Let's go ahead and take a short break. Let's take a 10-minute break and come back at... Uh, 340. Take a short. Okay. So let's finish up. We've only got uh, we've only got a few minutes before we're done here. So we're going to try and get in what we can. Um, so we worked through most of the stuff. We kind of looked at the syllabus. Uh, and you need to look the next would be point 11, which would be to, to look at the course schedule. So if you go to Inside Rankin, you go to the course. Um, I actually split my, I know some instructors keep their, their schedule on the syllabus document. I actually split it out 
um, because I update it pretty frequently, and it's less convenient to have it in a Word doc. So I have it in basically an Excel sheet instead. Uh, it's actually a Google Google sheet, but let's zoom in. Where's my zoom? There. Seventy-five percent. So if you look at the schedule um, here, you should see it looking like this. Is everybody seeing seeing the same thing? Are the numbers popping up for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a little bit of JavaScript that actually generates those numbers, so I wasn't sure. Um, so this is what the schedule looks like for the semester. So you can see for today, we've just we've got a bunch of announcements and such to go through, and, and as you've kind of seen, we've got a bunch of goals and such to get into. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Tomorrow, the plan is to finish up anything that we didn't finish today, um, and then to start you on the homework, right? Uh, my plan is to do my first lecture on Wednesday because I just know that we've got all this stuff to do together. So my, my first real lecture, we we get into the material on Wednesday, I'll go through intern database design, and those slides are already on first, so you can actually start looking at it. You, uh, are you going to record these lectures? This yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the I, will. Um, them, right? I will. I have gotten out of the habit over the summer of, of uploading them. It takes a little bit of work to do that. Um, it, and honestly, it usually takes um, a few hours to get that done. Um, in the, in, you know, it takes a, few, takes a few hours to edit it and then uploading it takes an hour or so because they're usually pretty big video files and such. So yes, I will try. I can't guarantee that. So I would recommend taking notes and not relying on it um, where possible. But I, I will try to record what I can. Okay. Um, so that's that's where that sits. So so we're going through a bunch of policies and, and introductions today. Tomorrow we'll finish that up and, and um, get you started on the homework and those kind of things. And so you can kind of look at the schedule and see where we're where we're going with everything. Cool. Um, so you got an agenda in there for basically every day as far as what the plan is and what the labs are and what the homework is. Um, that's our schedule. Uh, work ethic grading. Okay, so we have traditionally had a different. Um, every instructor has been kind of really coming up with their own policy for grading work ethic. Um, this year, we've got a more standardized approach that's being introduced, so that every course is kind of following the same procedure. Um, there's a decent amount to it. Um, I think the best thing for you to do is really read it yourself. I could explain it to you here, but I think it's something you really need to read um, and kind of understand. So look at the work ethic course. You can read some of the information here on the main page. I would really strongly recommend that you jump over on the right under handouts. There is the work ethic policy. I would ask that you actually read through this. Okay, I would I would strongly ask that you read through that document there for the work ethic policy, and also read what's here, and that will kind of explain how this is going to work this semester. Um, just so we're clear, this is not the same as it's been traditionally. It is different. So everybody starts at an 86 on the wall, and you'll see that in the instructions. Everybody starts with an 86, and you lose, and I add and subtract points as the course goes on. So everybody starts at a meets, and then you go up and down from there. So yes, you should already have a meets frame on that assignment right here. Cool? Yes. Okay. So I would really, really strongly advise you read that yourself um, because there's only so much I can communicate by reading it to you. Um, it's definitely something you need to understand yourself. So take a look at that. Um, one thing I will mention here, and it's in the work ethic, um, there are, um, one of the things that they're trying to do is, is help get study groups going and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, so that means kind of grouping, you know, getting together and, and meeting outside of class to kind of work with classmates um, to learn the material and those kind of things. Um, there are points on the work ethic um, grading system. On this rubric, there are points for attending those, those study groups, okay? Um, basically, what I want you to do, if you're interested in forming a study group, I would ask for um, you to kind of talk with your classmates you want to form that with me and come to me and we'll kind of talk over it make some plans um, and set a schedule um, if you look at i don't think this is on the work ethic course itself but if i go back to which i probably need to put it on the work ethic course too um, there's an assignment here on the awd 111 Add that to the calendar. There it is. So from that assignment, there's about a two, there's like a three page attachment to the course. If you're interested in joining a study group, you can read some more details here about the expectations. Um, you can definitely take a look at it. I think we'll talk more about that tomorrow um, as time kind of allows. Uh, but that's one thing to kind of be aware of. Yeah, study group can be a beneficial thing, but it's not necessarily a beneficial thing for everybody. Uh, it works for some people, it doesn't work for everybody. So if you're interested in, in doing that, just get in touch with me tomorrow and we can, we can see about getting this rolling. Cool? Okay. So we'll talk more. That's kind of what I want to announce there. Um, another quick announcement. Um, you may have heard about things called hackathons, right? Hackathons usually like meet for a 40 hour period from a Friday through a Sunday and build something. Um, sometimes you have even build games and we call it game jam, but a hackathon is usually something more business focused. Uh, we've been talking, you know, a few years about trying to get students to one. I've done several, attended several myself. Um, so we're actually in talks at the moment to potentially host one ourselves in December. Um, so if you want to set your calendars, um, we're talking about doing it December 3rd through 5th, um, is doing a, a hackathon here on the regular campus if you want to participate in it. Um, that would be kind of a team thing that you could do, a team exercise, so it's a good way to build some teamwork and get experience with that. It's not for grade, um, but it is one thing that's would be beneficial. So, so, what so we haven't decided on all the details yet. Um, but basically, a hackathon means um, you form a team. Usually, a team of three is probably going to be the sweet spot. Um, but basically, you get together and you build something in a weekend for summer, right? And the details of what you're going to be build, what you might build, or who, or we haven't worked all that out yet, but we're looking at doing that. So I just want to know, just want to set that out there so you know for scheduling, because we're talking about it being like an IT department hackathon um, in December. Cool. Um, probably more details forthcoming as we kind of set that out. We literally just picked a date for it last last week, so. We still got to kind of figure out the rest of the details. So, so that's that. Okay, so homework for tonight. Um, what I want you to do um, is go on to perusal. You kind of got an introduction to that as well so far. And you're going to go through a few different reading assignments. So, how to use perusal, we kind of already went through that as a class. Um, there's um, some scoring examples on the last page of that assignment, which are really good to look at, so you understand like what's a one, a two, and a zero. You know, so you're writing good, helpful annotations and comments and such. Um, we looked at the syllabus, and I, I, I started going through all the comments. I've seen eight, I've 
people are going to be really good about commenting and asking some questions on that. So that's that's good. Um, the set of instructions um, and the intro to database design. Those are the big things that I want you to do tonight for homework. Uh, so if I'm looking at perusal, I'll go back here. Um, so the first one being this setup instructions. So setup instructions is going to walk you through all the things you need to set up um, in terms of your software on your computer um, in order to do the assignments this semester. Um, so there's a bunch of things you need to get installed and updated. Um, because you've taken a previous course, you would probably have done some of this already. Uh, just a heads up, some there's some additional steps or some been some changes. So even if you've gone through this again, I'd ask you to go through the whole thing again. Whole thing again, uh, even if you've done it before. Um, because you want to make sure that you're up to the latest versions and everybody's on the same version of the software. Um, including and making sure you've got uh, one of the last things in here is installing you Node.js, which is the big thing that we'll be using this semester. So you make sure that that's it. Um, Visual Studio Code, there's some settings you need to change, some install some extensions and different things there. Um, another thing I will mention in terms of setting up your environment, I would also ask you to install the GitHub desktop client. Um, just uh, just a, I guess two weeks ago now, Friday the 13th, GitHub decided that they were going to stop password authentication for GitHub, so now you can only do token-based authentication. I've had some issues with some students already. We had some issues with not being able to uh, upload your code through Tortoise Git or through VS Code. It's been working for my own VS Code install still, and I've some students it's still working. Um, so one of the things I would ask is, is in addition to what's in here, go ahead and install the GitHub desktop client and get that set up um, because that seems to be the workaround to make it work. Um, Cool. So that's one thing to do tonight. I want you to go through all those those instructions, and then also start reading through the first homework assignment. So this is this is your first reading assignment um, that is due by Wednesday, and then we're going to talk about the details of that on Wednesday. So if you pull up the intro to data space assignment, just to show you, there's some interesting things going on here. Okay, so pull that up. Do you see where it says up at the top that this assignment has 11 parts? Do you see that? So this assignment in particular is what they call a multimodal assignment. It's actually a new feature on Perusal. Um, but that's, that's what's going on here. This is a multi-part assignment. Um, make sure that you go through all of the parts, okay? Um, so this first assign this first page is just showing you uh, kind of a table of contents that I put in there so you kind of know what's in here. Uh, so you say enter the database this enter databases uh, from the database journal. So the first piece is about a 28 page you know, 20 page reading assignment actually goes really quick. It's actually a really quick read. Um, but that's the first thing in here. The second thing in here is there is, uh, a short thing that I pulled about history of computers in the 1970s. The relevance to that is these relational databases really originate out of the 70s and out of some of the technology from that. So having a little bit of understanding of what the technology was gives you some insight into why they made the decisions that they made. You know, what would the world look like at that time? Um, so the intro to database design, like that first reading assignment is really the most important one in there. Um, the history is not as important as some of the others, to be honest. Um, but it is in there for reference, so you can kind of see. Um, if you go, if you're when you're in there, there. There's the second part. So when you get in there, history computers. Uh, you'll see I put a bunch of annotations on the different sections here, kind of calling out a few things that are noticeable in there to pay attention to. So this is something you can definitely like skip. This is something that you don't need to know all the details that are in this document. It's just to give you some background. Cool? Uh, the first one's really important, um, but this one is less so. Um, after that, if we go to the next one, 
you're going to see that there is a video about ER diagrams. This is also really important to watch. Um, it'll give you a good introduction to what we call an ERD, which is how we kind of start designing and documenting and coming up with the database design. Because that's one of the first things we do. Cool? Um, there's also another two videos after this um, from a, a thing called CBT Nuggets. This, this is more IT focused, just as a heads up. This video, there's two videos from CBT Nuggets. These are more from like an IT perspective, not really from a developer perspective, but he has some decent insights. So that's why I share them. Okay. So the main two that I want you to focus on from there is the first one is the database journal article and the ER diagrams. Right? Those are the two that are really going to factor into my, my lecture on what say. Cool. So that's that's kind of what I want you to do tonight is to do the setup instructions and work your way through this homework and as well as finishing up anything tomorrow, finishing up some of the stuff tomorrow um, in terms of setup and such. Yeah, so that's kind of the plan is to get a, a jump start on the theory. Cool. Questions? So you'll see the previous part and the next part are up in the top and the bottom of that screen. Um, one thing you'll notice with the larger reading assignment like this, if you're in the, the database journal article, um, in order to get to the next part, you actually have to read all the way down to the all the way down to the bottom to get to the next the next part thing. So next part will be all the way at the end here. And I've interspersed it, you'll see that, and I kind of skipped over it. Um, in between these, in between these I've kind of added some informal quizzes so you can kind of think about what you just read and, and, and have some discussion. So these are more like discussion starters. If that makes sense, to kind of give you some things to think about um, and discuss on Perusal just to get the discussion started. Cool. Question? Okay. So that's kind of the, the gist of today. Um, we've got a few minutes before class lets out. Because if I remember right, we let out. Four four twenty five. Okay, so we've got we've got about twenty five minutes. Um, so you can use that remaining twenty five minutes to get jump start on like the setup instructions and the reading, um, and then we'll let you go for the day. <laughs>